As we looked at Psalm 64 this morning, I asked a question at the start of my sermon that I didn't really answer, and I wonder if you picked up on that. Psalm 64, which we looked at, sets out the troubles of God's king who is plotted against by a rowdy mob of wicked men, and it records for us his prayer for preservation and protection. The fact that God's king makes this prayer should surprise us. God's king, God's Messiah, God's Christ, those words are all interchangeable, is by definition the blessed one of God. And yet here we have God's king praying for preservation from the plots of perverse men. God's king was meant to be a God-empowered, victorious conqueror pouring out prosperity and peace on God's people, rewarding the good, punishing the bad. And so as we look at these Psalms, we're left asking the question, how can God's king face such troubles that we read of in this Psalm? How can this be the experience of the one blessed by God, empowered to be victorious, empowered to cause God's people to prosper? How can God's king face troubles like this? I want to think more about that question tonight. It's a persistent question. The Psalms keep throwing this question at us. It's a persistent question, and it's an important question. It's important because the Bible is the story of God's rule over us as king. It starts in Eden, of course, the garden, where God as creator, where God as God is king over creation. He's king over humanity, and men and women that he has made are his loving, loyal subjects. King and subjects in paradise. That's what we have in Eden. But mankind are tempted into rebellion, insurrection, treason against their king. And from there, in Genesis 3, like we read this morning, from there start all the troubles of mankind. They, they ripple out from that moment. Because life outside the rule of God, life in rebellion against God as king, is life in difficulty. But God in his mercy, in his grace, God in his glory, promises to restore his rule. He promises to pardon the rebels. He promises to release them. And he promises to restore them. To restore prosperity, to restore peace, and to give them eternal life with him as it was meant to be. God's glorious promise. And as time goes by and as the story is told, this promise of God is clarified further for us, bit by bit. It's like the colors are filled in in the picture. One man, Abraham, is told that all the world will be blessed through his family. And in particular, from his family, kings will come. One of his descendants, Judah, is told that from his branch of the family, the king will come. From his branch of the family, there will be a royal scepter that will never depart a king. He's told that all the peoples of the world will submit to his branch of the family. 400 years later, it's prophesied by an enemy of God's people, again, that the ruler's scepter will not depart from Israel and that the peoples all around will become subject to Israel and submit to them. And that one from Israel will exercise dominion. It's the promise of a king to rule over the nations from God's people. God will rule the world through a man from this family that will grow into a nation. God will rule the world through a man from this family. The blessings of God's rule over the world, peace, prosperity, eternal life, they'll come through one man. They'll come through a king. And here we have God's blueprint 
for redeeming and restoring the world through his king. If you know the story, you'll know that God gives his people his first king, Saul. He's tall, he's handsome, he's rich, he's well connected, but he's a disaster. He fails to defeat the Philistine invaders. Worse, he fails to obey God's word. The problem with Saul is that he too has a rebel heart. He too has a rebel heart. But God, ever full of mercy and grace, says to his people, I will give you a king with a heart like my heart. A king with a heart after my heart. He'll not be the obvious choice. But you judge by outward appearances. I look at the heart. And so it is we're introduced to David, the writer of this psalm. He comes into the picture in contrast to Saul, the king after the people's heart. He's presented as the one after God's heart. And he's empowered with the Holy Spirit to rule God's people. God's chosen king, his, his, his blueprint to restore a rebellious, ruined world. God's gift to bless the world with peace, prosperity, and eternal life in all of its fullness. And yet, as we sing the songs of God's King, and they're particularly bunched together from Psalm 51 to Psalm 66, a collection of David's songs, Peace, prosperity, and fullness of joy, they seem a long way off, don't they? What we see is struggle, pain, danger, seeming defeat. If we were to read Psalms 52 through to 60, we'd see David dealing with very specific opponents and enemies one after another right throughout his reign. God's king facing opposition and danger. In recent weeks, as we've looked at Psalms 62 through to 64, we see that David is still facing opposition and danger. And these three Psalms, along with Psalm 61, form a group of four. They're the prayers of God's king. The prayers of God's king from the struggle. These are the prayers of God's king from the struggle. The struggle. Listen to his prayers. Have your Bible open and we'll skim through them and, and look at some particular points. Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He's banished. He's at the ends of the earth and he's praying that God would protect him and bless his king. Verse 6. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Psalm 62. He's attacked and battered. Verse 3. But here he is praying, pouring out his heart. Reminding himself that God is a refuge. Verse 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. His prayer from the struggle. Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry, weary land where there's no water. He's in the wilderness. He has nothing but a longing for God. Verse 9, he tells us, he reminds himself that his opponents will be judged. They'll be defeated. But, verse 11, the king shall rejoice in God and all who swear by him, all who serve him, shall exult. For the mouths of liars, the opponents will be stopped. The king and his people will have reason to rejoice. Psalm 64, hear my voice, O God, and my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me 
from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers. It's a prayer for protection from hidden danger. The king is in trouble. He's confident of vindication before the world. Verse 9. And he's committed to rejoicing. Verse 10. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. Here are the prayers of God's king in the midst of the struggle. The prayers of God's king in the midst of the struggle. Here's the point, friends. Well, two points. The king faces enemies. God's king faces enemies. And secondly, God's king prays in the struggle. God's king faces enemies. It's not all plain sailing as God reestablishes his kingship, his kingdom on earth. It's not all plain sailing. God's king has God's power. He's empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, God himself. He has God's promises. But he spends his time on the run, in exile, far from home, far from family, hounded even by his own family, facing murderous plots. To to gather up the language of these four Psalms, he's faint, he's far off, he's attacked, he's battered, he's longing for God's presence, and he's ambushed suddenly from shooters in the dark by their secret plots. It is a struggle to establish God's kingdom again on earth. We see a struggling king in these four Psalms. But we see a praying king too. He prays as the struggle goes on. His response to the struggle is to seek God's help. He asks God to establish his kingdom, fulfill his promises, and bring all mankind to ponder and rejoice in God's own works. He's praying from the midst of the struggle. He's a struggling king, but a praying king. He's not struggling because of a lack of power. Uh, Psalm 62, verse 2, speaking of God, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. It's not a lack of power as the reason for a struggle. He's not struggling either because of a lack of faith. Psalm 63, verse 8. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. His faith is holding firm and he is confident that God is holding him up. He's not struggling because of a lack of faith. He's not struggling either because the enemy is too great for him. Psalm 64, verses 7 to 9. God shoots his arrow at them and they are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads. And then all mankind fears. They'll tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. It's not a struggle because of a lack of power, a lack of faith, or his enemies are too big for him. It's a struggle simply because it is a fight. It's a battle. It is war. God's kingdom of peace and prosperity and joy and blessing, God's kingdom of paradise is established in struggle. There's a war on. We don't know for sure when these four songs were written. There are similarities. There are links between them that, that join them together. They're like four s- siblings in a family all holding hands. There's the ideas of the ends of the earth, the wilderness. God is a rock. God is a fortress. They all fit together. But they could fit at least two situations in David's life. They could fit the situation before he is king, when he's on the run from Saul. They fit the situation when he is king and he's on the run from his rebellious son, Absalom. 
The point is, it's always a struggle for David. It's always a struggle for David. Part of that is his own sin. After Saul is dealt with, David is established on the throne as king over God's people, but David commits adultery. And he has the husband murdered, the man after God's own heart. And his troubles with his son Absalom, who rebels against him, they arise from that sin of David's, his murderous adultery. David, it turns out, is a rebel too. David can't establish this kingdom of God and usher in all the prosperity and all the blessing. And even his wise son Solomon, with all of his wisdom, with all of his wealth, with all of his military might, he can't do it either. He too is a sinner. A thousand years later, one of David's descendants would appear on the scene. He would be a preacher. And his first sermons would declare, Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. And he did a whole host of miracles that brought what to the earth? Health restored. Peace Evil defeated and cast out. Food, plenty of food. The danger of nature, the storms, subdued. It's the kingdom. God's rule over creation and men and women. Even over Satan. And he claimed to be God's glorious king, the Christ and his followers saw it and gave Jesus that title. Jesus Christ. It's not his surname. It's his title. Jesus King. Jesus Blessed King. Jesus God's King bringing God's kingdom. But it was a struggle to establish the kingdom. He too found himself in the wilderness, attacked by Satan, tempted. He too was plotted against by evildoers, if we use the words of Psalm 64. He too was plotted against by evildoers who planned to thrust him down, to use the words of Psalm 62. They sought to destroy his life, to use the words of Psalm 63. The Jews couldn't understand this. Uh, a suffering Messiah, that's, that's a contradiction. Surely God's power and God's work will be unstoppable and obvious. Surely. But then they have all the pointers in front of them in these songs that many of them knew off by heart. The king would have to fight and struggle to establish the kingdom. It was a struggle, but God gave him victory. To use the words of Psalm 64, the thoughts of Psalm 64, God used the weapons of the enemy against the enemy himself. They nailed him to the cross, but he used the cross to conquer them. And he rose victorious, victorious over sin, victorious over Satan, victorious over death. And he rose and rose and rose to the right hand of God, to be crowned king of heaven and earth at God's right hand. God's king. And what is he doing now? He's offering to pardon rebels, to release them and to restore them, to restore prosperity and peace and give everlasting life. The king is offering life under his rule. Life under his blessing. But the struggle for his kingdom isn't over. The enemy forces are doomed, but not yet fully defeated. It's like the walls of the city have been breached, but the whole city is not yet subdued. We don't yet see 
as the writer of the Hebrews tells us, all things under the feet of Jesus. We don't yet see Jesus as the mighty conqueror of all. And his people still struggle. We still struggle with sin. We still struggle with temptation. We still struggle with doubt. We still struggle with fear and worry. We're under attack. We face opposition. It is still a struggle. Until he comes again. I've said it many times. Please don't miss this. It shouldn't surprise us that the Christian life is hard. It's good, but it's hard. And we shouldn't be caught unawares by that. We live in this struggle. The king is on the throne, but the enemy is active. We are still in the wilderness of this world. We are still attacked, battered, plotted against, shot at, sometimes literally, always metaphorically. It's still a struggle. But it won't always be a struggle. The king's first coming, what was it like? He came as a baby. Weak in human terms. Dependent. A humble coming. Not very kingly. His second coming will be kingly. He will come as victorious conqueror. All will be swept before him. All will bow down before him. Every person will acknowledge that he is Lord. Now, friends, is the struggle. Every day is the struggle. But not always. Not always. But here's the greatest bit. What does the king do in the struggle? Psalm 61, Psalm 62, Psalm 63, Psalm 64. The king prays in the struggle. His kingdom is still in the struggle phase, not yet in the victory, final victory, full victory. So he is still praying. What is King Jesus doing in heaven right this minute? He's praying. He's interceding for us. He's praying to his heavenly Father for us. He's praying for you. That's what he's doing right now. When mum died a few months ago, one of the bitterest thoughts about it was that I've lost one of the people who undoubtedly prayed the most for me. That made me fear a little. But I haven't lost the person who prays the most for me. None of us will ever lose the person who prays the most for us. Our chief intercessor. Hebrews 7.25 He always lives. He lives forever, eternal life now. Why does he always live? Or to what end? To what purpose? To make intercession for us. To pray for us. What is Jesus doing between his ascension, going up in the clouds, and the second coming, coming again in the clouds? He's praying for us. He's praying for us in our struggle. And he prays for us here in the struggle, he's far above the struggle, but he prays for us as he prays for himself. Because we're joined to him. What's the illustration that Paul uses? Jesus is the head and we're the body. You can't get a much closer union than that, can you? Our struggles are, in a sense, his struggles. Our needs are, in a sense, his needs. Our business is his business. He is high and, and lifted up and far above it all, but his body is here on earth still in the struggle. And so in that sense, he is still in the struggle. And so he is still praying for us. And in that sense, it's almost like 
he puts our prayers and our needs that we have in the first person. In a sense, Jesus, as our head, joined to us in the closest possible union and, and bond, praise and language of I and me for us, because we are him, we are his body. Hear us prayer in heaven. Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. He is not faint in himself, but his people are, his body is. And we are bound so tightly that our fate, our identity, so tied up with his, that when we're attacked, he's attacked. And whenever we're faint, in a sense, he is faint. And he prays with us. Our words become his words. And he is praying for us. And his prayers are perfect. And the father delights to hear the prayers of his son, the one with whom he is well pleased, his beloved son. And he delights to give the son whatever the son wants because the two of them think the same. And so if the son wants it, the father wants it because it's right and good, but also because he loves the son. And so Jesus Christ, the son of God, our king, is praying these things on our behalf for us taking our words and making them his words. Listen to what he is praying for you, to his heavenly Father. Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. Lead me, lead my body, the body of which I am the head, to the rock that is higher than they are. 61, verse 4. Let them dwell in your dwelling place, even as I am. Let them enjoy the closeness that I have under your wings. Psalm 61, verse 8. Let them join with me in eternally praising you. Bring them here to sing with me. As they lift up their voices, Lord's day by Lord's day. Let them join with me in the chorus in heaven. Psalm 63, verse 5. Father, satisfy them with the finest of fellowship with you, even as I have it in heaven. Psalm 64, verse 4. Father, hide them from all the secret plots of wicked men, the evil one. Hide them, protect them. Friends, you and I have one praying for us. And he's one who knows the struggle of this life. He knows the struggle of obedience. He knows the temptations we face. He knows what is best for us. He knows what the Father wants. And the Father loves to hear him and loves to answer him. And he's the one through whom God is sending prosperity and peace an eternal life, fullness of joy forever. And so when you feel the struggle of the Christian life, remember the king's prayers for you. He is praying for you. Amen.